What's up, everybody? Welcome to the All Sooners podcast. Last one of February. It's episode 239. It's February 28th. That's Ryan. That's Randall. They're in Oklahoma City, Norman, Moore area. I'm John Hoover. I'm in Tulsa. Guys, tomorrow's February 29th. It's leap year. It's an election year. It's an Olympic year. And for Oklahoma, it's the SEC year, 2024. It's a big one. Got to get that thing rolling. I, I, how are you celebrating your leap day, Hoob? Are you watching the terrible uh, movie Leap Year or whatever? Or will you just be uh, off and about doing normal stuff? I will probably be digging a hole of some kind in my backyard. Just because it sounds so much better than watching Leap Year or whatever. Unsurprisingly, I've never even heard of Leap Year. So I think that's very on brand for us. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Uh, guys, it's the... Uh, I don't know if you've all been keeping up, but it's um, it's the football offseason. Still crickets from OU on giving any player access, coach access. We haven't heard anything yet. So since it's the offseason and we can't talk about the football team, what's going on with the football team, let's go to Vegas. In honor of Ryan's hat, let's go to Vegas. Uh, and what I mean by that is let's look at uh, some of the betting odds that have come out for uh, various things. Like, uh, say, um, to win the conference, to win the SEC. Did you guys see earlier in the week, OU is a 50-1 to 1 <laughs> odds tied with Auburn to win the SEC. To win the SEC. 50-1. to 1. I mean, they're not going to win the SEC, but if you got a dollar and you'd like to win 50, that's a good bet. That, those are good. That's good money, isn't it? it yeah. <laughs> it, yeah. It feels like, um, you know, even if, like you mentioned, OU is not going to win the SEC, the, I think a lot of the, um, the where that comes into question is those teams that you mentioned that they're down there with, a team like Auburn, um, you know, is in the grand scheme of the SEC, is Oklahoma on the same level of a team like Auburn? You know, I think Auburn's coming off of, what, a 6-6 six and six season. Uh, it seems like, at least from, uh, you know, and obviously we we follow the team, so we're, we're very in tune with what's going on with Oklahoma, but it seems like this team has a lot more promise, a lot more, um, that could go right than a team like Auburn. It seems like Oklahoma's ceiling is a lot higher than a team like Auburn. Um, even if they don't have that same SEC experience that obviously the Tigers do, it's, it feels like um, you know the promise, the the young guys that Oklahoma has, the coaching staff, the the um, kind of the step forward into a new era. It feels like there's a lot more that could go right for Oklahoma than a team like Auburn. But again, you have to prove it before you can really be taken seriously, especially in a tough conference yeah. like the SEC. Yeah, I'm trying to pull up the Auburn schedule right now just to because Oklahoma's better than Auburn, like no question. Uh, but they better be. <laughs> they better be. But the the Sooners, I mean, when you look at it, we we've talked about the schedule. Brent Venables has talked about the schedule. When you look at like last year's top twelve of how many of those teams are on the schedule for Oklahoma, they've got new coordinators on both sides of the football. We have no idea what they're doing on the offensive line. They they lost their best offensive lineman, and, and they're having to replace a ton of that. Jackson Arnold's entering his first year as a starter, like full year as a starter, not just one game. What does that look like? We don't know if Brent Venables is still a good head coach, by the way. They have a close win against Texas, and it was an awesome win. You should have beat Kansas. You should have beat Oklahoma State, and a lot of that was on coaching. Now, I think that one of the big reasons for that, uh, got the job at Mississippi State, Congrats to the Selmans. I don't think that'll go well. Um, we, I mean, we saw Jeff Levy's inability to uh, call a game out of a paper bag, basically, through all the awful, like, one-possession losses. But we don't know if Britt Venables is a good head coach. They, they were a lot better last year, but in a lot of those games, they had a veteran quarterback to lean on, got out in front, all yeah. that stuff. The close games that they had, uh, Texas went incredible. But the second half was not trending that direction until Dylan Gabriel pulled that thing out of the fire. Kansas was a coaching disaster. Oklahoma State was a coaching disaster. It hard to do. I'm not going to take anything out of the bowl game either way. That I think that's a fool's errand these days. I don't. I don't really care either way on that. I, I think it's totally fair, especially when you consider who are the teams that are picked to, near the top of the league. Texas, Oklahoma doesn't get them at home. They never do, but they don't get them at home. Alabama is right there on OU's schedule. Uh, you got to go to Ole Miss and to Missouri, two of the kind of surprise, really good teams. When you look at it from an odd maker's perspective, it might seem weird for Oklahoma to be 50 to one, but I, there are more questions than answers about this Oklahoma team going to the SEC. 
potential to be a lot better on defense, but I, it's still just a big unknown. A really talented, high potential unknown, like Randall said, but I, I've got no clue. I love the number 50. It's half a hundred. It's how many conference championships Oklahoma owns, which is more than anybody in the history of college football, and it's their odds 50-1 to to win the SEC. I'm just saying, if I'm in Vegas anytime soon and I've got 10 bucks in my pocket, I'm going to drop 50. I'm going to drop 10 bucks to on 50 to 1 owe you to win the SEC. Here's who's ahead of them. Cuz 10 bucks is 10 bucks, right? I mean, you don't need 10 bucks. It's that's not necessarily bad money after good. It's just it's just a whim. Uh, but here's who's ahead of them. Georgia is at 2 to 1. Texas is second at 5 to 2 odds to win the SEC. Ole Miss is third at 13 to 2. Alabama is fourth, nine to one. Tennessee, also nine to one. LSU, ten to one. Missouri, eleven to one. And guys, Texas A&M, who hasn't won a conference championship in a generation, is twenty-two to one. Texas A&M is favored over Oklahoma to win a conference championship. And, what? And that's even, get- even more interesting because they're coming in with a brand new head coach. I mean, we really have I no know. idea to expect what to expect from Mike Elko and company. Obviously this past season, he had some success at Duke, but as we mentioned, the sec is a whole different ball game. And we've seen Texas A&M continuously in the past with, I mean, just loads and loads of talent underperform. And now obviously things might be different with Mike Elko. If he can get that, that talent to uh, perform at the level that it should, obviously A&M will probably be right there in the mix, but we haven't seen that come to fruition. Like who mentioned since what 2012. Um, And so, uh, I think it's it's a similar situation to Oklahoma with Texas A&M, especially with a new head coach. You've got to prove it before anyone will believe it. Yeah, well, and you look at across, what's the – is Tennessee that high purely because Nico had a good bowl game and Jack Starnold didn't? You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I wonder how much that is there. It, it's just – it becomes a uh, – I don't have an issue with the 50-1. to 1. I think that's – I think Oklahoma's – far off from competing the sec and that has way more to do with georgia than than anything that oklahoma or lsu or alabama like everyone's playing catch up and i I don't think anyone's particularly close to georgia i know alabama popped up and won last year but it's not nick saban uh different can of worms yeah georgia's like the boss at the end of the the yeah boss battle at the end of the video game you might march through and knock these guys off and knock those guys. And you might come out there thinking I'm pretty good at this game. And then you get to the boss and he just slays Darth Vader. He slays you and you're like, eh, okay, I get it. And, and yeah. It's, sorry. It's, it's one of those things where it's like 50 to one doesn't sound awful to me. Cause I think it'd be a 50 to one shot for Oklahoma to beat Georgia. So go, go with that. But to have like Tennessee LSU who just lost the one thing, holding that whole program together, which is Jaden Daniels, please go to Vegas, Jaden, please go to Vegas. Jayden. <laughs> Uh, and it, like all of that is obviously ridiculous. I don't, it, it's one of those things of like the ordering of the teams different than the number. And I have no issue with the number. It, it's the ordering of the teams ahead of Oklahoma that you're like, yeah, really? Um, let me give you guys the odds for the college football playoff. This is also from, that was uh, from betonline.ag. This is also from betonline. Uh, ahead, Oklahoma right now to make the college football playoff, to make the 12 team college football playoff. Oklahoma is 10 to one, which is tied with Washington, which has a new coaching staff and a new quarterback and a new philosophy and a new, you know what I mean? You see what I'm saying? 10 to one is pretty stacked odds to make the college football playoff ahead of Oklahoma in the sec. You've got Auburn at nine to one. You've got Missouri at 11 to two. You've got Texas A&M at five to one. You've got LSU at five to two. You've got Alabama at nine to four. You've got Tennessee at two to one. Ole Miss at seven to four, Texas, at two to five, and then Georgia, you're not going to make any money with this bet. One to ten. Okay, <laughs> you bet ten dollars to make one. That's not going to work. But here's who else is ahead of Oklahoma in this betting odds: Kansas State at one to two, Utah at ten to eleven. All right, try to keep up with the numbers. Arizona is at two to one. Penn State, who hasn't done anything in a long time, is two to one. Louisville nine to four. Kansas is ahead of Oklahoma, has better odds to make the college football playoff at 5-2. to two. Notre Dame, 5-2. to two. NC State at 5-1. to one. Texas Tech, oof, <laughs> at 11-2. to two. Iowa and Iowa State are both 7-1. to one. And Oklahoma State, the final indignity for OU joining the SEC, 
is eight to one odds better than Oklahoma's ten to one odds to make the playoff. Good lord! I, I feel like a lot of this this factors in is not. I mean, I think Ryan touched on it too with the SEC odds. It's not saying that Texas Tech, Kansas, Kansas State are better than Oklahoma, but with the new playoff format and the way that the Big Twelve is laid out now, you've got a lot of new new teams, a lot of, uh, really, I mean, the conference is up for grabs. And so I don't think that, uh, you know, going into next season, when we look at the Big 12 media poll, I mean, who would you guys pick to win the Big 12 right now? It's kind of a crapshoot, right? So, And when you look at it like that, as really any of these 10, 12 teams could win the Big 12, it gives all 10 or 12 of those teams a decent shot at being in the playoffs. And that's, I mean, a team like a Kansas State, who's got a new quarterback coming in, uh, if they're, it, that's been a team that's been pretty good in the Big 12 throughout their history with, you know, the two big dogs, Oklahoma and Texas, now gone. Um, you know, Utah coming off of a down year for that program. Uh, obviously, Arizona's coming in with a new coaching staff. I know that their quarterback and main receiver are coming back. But still, I mean, that, that leaves the door kind of wide open for all of those teams, really, to if one of them can step up and grab the conference, they've got almost a guaranteed bid at the college football playoff. And so, um, I think that if Oklahoma had stayed in the Big 12, they would probably have great odds because yeah, uh, it's overwhelming. Yeah, over, like you said, overwhelming odds because the same principle applies. They would have a good shot at winning that conference title. Um, but that's life in the SEC, I guess. Yeah. It, it's going to be like a great readjustment. Like used to when we had win totals across the country, you'd have two or three teams at, you know, the 11 and a half, a team or two at the 10 and a half because it's spread across all conferences. Like now – Michigan, Ohio State, like Michigan may be the overwhelming best team in the Big Ten. They might drop a couple of games because they have to play uh, in a year where they might have to play a Washington and a really good Ohio State team and an Oregon team as opposed to Northwestern and yep. the Nebraska's before Matt Rule, stuff like that. Right. Same thing, like you're going to have a bunch of these Big 12 teams open with really big win totals and a bunch of, oh, look at Oklahoma down there at seven and a half. It's like, well, yeah, you're not playing in an actual football conference <laughs> looking at you, ACC. Like out, outside of – Clemson and Florida State like it's a whole lot of garbage over there like it's gonna be this weird reacclimating to more of an NFL style of like eight and four gets Alabama into the playoff more years than not like in in college football that's a wild thing to do but like if you're playing in the Big Ten or the SEC unless you just go over against like the the top 15 teams and you only beat up on the the real bottom feeders then you're gonna have a good case to be like yeah I mean Kansas State's 10 and 2, but they're 10 and 2 and second in the Big 12 in a year where maybe only one other team is a top 25 caliber. There might be a lot of good football, but there's no great or elite football. I, I think it's it's a it'll take a few years for everyone to parse through like why do the SEC win totals look so much weirder than the Big 12 win totals? Like, well, yeah, because other than Vanderbilt, no one's the kid in the corner with the dunce hat on. Like there's half of the that half the Big 12 is that. And, if- and- in 2024, if Oklahoma State w- makes it to the playoff and Oklahoma doesn't, the <laughs> state is going to rip in half. There's going to be a giant fissure running right down the middle of it. It's People are going to lose their minds if OU doesn't make the playoff, the 12-team playoff, and Oklahoma State does. Ooh. I, I think, it, I think like Ryan mentioned, it'll be interesting to kind of parse through how if you have a, you know, say, 10-2 and two Texas Tech team versus a 8-4, and 9-3 and three Oklahoma team where – you know, that, that Texas Tech team might not have played the same schedule that, you know, Oklahoma did playing Tennessee and Alabama and going to Missouri and going to LSU and those types of things where Texas Tech has Colorado and these other schools on the schedule. So how do you kind of stack those things together if if Oklahoma has two more losses than Texas Tech, but those two, lo- two losses are to Alabama and at LSU? You know, how, how do you how do you factor those things in? I think, like Ryan said, that'll be really, really interesting to see what the playoff committee, how they decide to handle those things. Yeah, the SEC will almost always get the benefit of the doubt there. Um, Just on reputation alone, Ryan mentioned the win totals. Let's go there real quick. OU opened, uh, and we've talked about this, I think, last week or week before. uh, OU opened at 6.5, but immediately went to 7.5. 7.5 is their win total. If Guys, if Brent wins seven games this year, the fan base is going to lose its mind. Simple as that. Yeah. And and like Ryan Ryan, you mentioned, we still don't know if Brent Venables is a good head coach. I think if – he wins seven games this year, then uh, that's going to be, I think a lot more people right or wrong will, will lean towards the negative of that, of that opinion. As long as Jackson Arnold stays healthy there, that's always yeah, that's the win one. total thing's always tough. Cause it's like, okay, you look back in year one and um, yeah, they weren't going to like losing to Texas and getting blown out by Texas. 
Never good for an Oklahoma head coach. But as you saw, the understanding of Dylan Gabriel just not being there, people were okay to say, okay, we, you can cover that one up a little bit and, and roll from there. Uh, the context will matter a great deal, but yeah, you, you got to get to, you got, you can't like recede too far. I think if anything less than eight or nine and people are going to be like, what the heck is going on? I, I think people could handle like growing pains. If the defense looks like a lot better and it's keeping Oklahoma in games and David Stone looks like everything that David Stone hopefully is for Oklahoma from the fan perspective. And then, you know, you have a, a crucial interception in death Valley and that's why you go eight and four instead of nine and three for a uh, sophomore. That's basically a red shirt freshman like that. That's a lot different than like uh, Eli Drinkowitz goes in there and, and beats you when he, he also beat up on a soft schedule. Ash. like you, you talk about Randall, that how it's going to be like Missouri had the softer sec schedule last year, Missouri and Ole Miss same record as Oklahoma and the playoff committee never even thought about pumping Oklahoma up into a new year's six spot. Why? Cause mm-hmm. Oklahoma was playing in the big 12. I, yeah. I also think – sorry, sorry, who I, I think that it will be interesting, too, to see – you mentioned Jackson Arnold. How if, – if he doesn't perform very well and Dylan Gabriel goes and lights it up at Oregon, then, you know, what what is the fan base, the Oklahoma fan base? How do they react to that? Because then it's almost like you guys made the wrong decision. You could have kept this veteran quarterback who could have kept us in contention in a powerful conference this year. Now, I'm not saying that's the right opinion to have, but it'll be interesting to see because there's a good chance that Dylan Gabriel – goes and has a great year at Oregon. I think that most of us are probably expecting him to light it up there. Um, and so I think I think that'll also be interesting to see how the fan base reacts. If Oklahoma doesn't have the year they're expecting, if Jackson Arnold doesn't have the year they're expecting, and Dylan Gabriel has a great year, uh, how, how the fan base will see that. Because we know the national media kind of um, got after Oklahoma for losing a lot of players through the portal, things like that. And the guys, us on the ground who cover Oklahoma, we said, well, we expected this. this is, we knew this was coming. We kind of thought Jackson Arnold would take that mantle. Um, but when, when he does take over that mantle, if it doesn't go as expected, then it'll be interesting to see kind of what the, the, uh, aftermath of that is. If that quarterback situation unfolds, like you said, at Oregon and Oklahoma, there will be psychotic people who say, you guys chose the wrong quarterback. We should have kept Dylan Gabriel for 2024 season. No, no. Back off of that opinion. That's a dumb opinion. Um, here's the deal. You look at seven and a half for OU's win total. And you think, well, they'll, they'll go over that, right? Number one, the non-conference is so soft. That's four wins. Okay, I agree with that. A- after that, you need four more to get to to get to get eight, right, to get over seven and a half. Tennessee opens the season. Tennessee was pretty good last year. Tennessee's going to be pretty good this year, right? Auburn absolutely isn't great, but this is your first SEC road game. Hmm, gets uh, interesting. How does the team react to going on the road? And Auburn, hey, Auburn's done a good job restocking, kind of rebuilding, um, at least on paper, it looks like they have. So that becomes a little more tricky, I think. Um, then comes Texas, right? You're That's a coin toss no matter what. So I think four and two is on the table right there. I think three and three could be on the table if you're not sharp, if you get you know, the wrong guy hurt at the wrong position, something like that. Then you're halfway through the schedule. The back half is South Carolina. You better win that one or else that's at home. And then you're at Ole Miss. That's a very tough one. You'd rather play Ole Miss, I think, early in the season because they've got so many new guys, so many new guys at so many positions. You'd rather play them early, but, you know, you get them the, what, seventh, eighth game of the season. Maine, obviously that's a win. Uh, And then to me, there's a big one at Missouri. I think that's going to decide a lot, like a lot, a lot, a lot of recruiting, a lot of trash talk, a lot of maybe future rivalry, um, stuff like that. Bragging rights. Alabama is at home. I know Saban's retired, but hey, good luck with Alabama coming into Norman in November. Have you seen how many five stars that they've got on their roster? Then you got LSU on the road, Baton Rouge road game, end of November. Have fun with that. Um, I said when the schedule came out, I said eight and four. I'm starting to think seven and five might be entirely realistic, you guys. Do, do we? Uh, the offensive line could be awful. Yeah. Like we, we have no clue. Like, and and very for dangerous. me, yeah, it, it it becomes like very very cautious stepping into this thing. Of it, it's not a hey, you know that these are highly touted guys that they'll be in most work with for two or three years, and it's just a matter of plugging and playing. It's like you got Sexton. 
and Everett probably at center. And then I have no clue where anyone else is coming from. You got so many transfers. The best transfer you picked up, it, you're probably having to go, can he make the North Texas to the SEC adjustment all in one off season? We did the transfer talk stuff, um, talking to some people behind the scenes, very up and down, mixed reviews of some of the other veteran offensive linemen that were brought in. You can't succeed in the SEC with a first-year starter at quarterback in a, in a defense that is going to be really, really talented, hoping to work some young guys in, trying to take another big step forward. If your offensive line is like a, a dumpster fire, and I think there's a real chance the offensive line's a total dumpster fire. And if it is, then brace. Brace for impact, because we saw what that looked like a couple of years ago when the offensive line and the running game were pretty good, but you couldn't get any kind of consistency on third and long, stuff like that. Like, you're going to be asking Jack Starnum to do – a lot without the protection in front. I, I mean, the offensive line could settle in really well, and Missouri's having to replace basically their entire defense. Ole Miss is a team of mercenaries. Auburn has talent, but I think is still a year away from being competent on the football side of things, even though I think Hugh Freeze is a good coach, whatever you think of him. Like, uh, LSU could have no defense and no Jaden Daniels to paper. It. Like, there, there are paths there, but it all starts with can you protect Jackson Arnold? And I don't know that Oklahoma can. I, have, I just have no clue. I 100% that's exactly what I was going to say is that you look at the offensive line especially in the SEC that you have to be great in the trenches to win in the SEC it's just a must and that's going to be a huge question for Oklahoma on the offensive side of the ball this year in the trenches um I'm old so I remember these things because I lived through them but the 2005 season coming off that 2004 national championship loss to uh, USC in the Orange Bowl the 2005 season, everybody said, well, look at it. We got Bomar back and we got a five-star quarterback and we've got all this, all these guys that are filling in in the offensive line. No, it was a disaster. The offensive line uh, was terrible. Bomar wasn't any good because it was his first year to start. I mean, I see some parallels. A um, little bit like 2008, coming off that 2008 national championship loss in the Orange Bowl to Florida this time. 2009, the offensive line was rebuilt entirely again. And I remember um, Andre Ware on ESPN coming out saying, I'm going to pick Oklahoma to go eight and four. And we all laughed and lost our minds and said, what? What are you talking about? And his reasoning was, and I talked to him about this since. He said, I remembered it. I remember that. And he said, Oklahoma's offensive line was completely rebuilt. And Sam Bradford didn't make it out of the first half of the first game, guys. You know, you got your Heisman winner coming back. Yeah, too bad. He can't play this year because he's hurt because they can't protect him. Protection for your quarterback is everything. And I think Jackson Arnold is going to be very stressed this year if they can't figure out the protection system, uh, the blocking schemes uh, to keep their quarterback safe. Yeah. I've Upside, no BYU in the SEC to take out your starting quarterback. That's true. So avoided <laughs> that. I was just going to say, I mean, you know, first year as a starter, obviously in the SEC, that's a lot of pressure on a guy. We saw, I mean, I know, Ryan, you said you can't really take anything away from the bowl game. The one thing that kind of was, I don't want to say similar, was that you're playing with a completely rebuilt offensive line. A lot of those guys that were there last year uh, are were not playing in the bowl game. But you, even then, you had the guys like Walter Rouse, McCade Matoyer. They're not going to be there next year. So uh, we saw what that looked like when Jackson Arnold was pressured, uh, kind of held onto the ball too long, had a fumble there in the uh, – Alamo Bowl. So um, obviously that's going to uh, need to be something that Oklahoma really harps on this offseason is getting that offensive line right. Um, and you mentioned it. We'll have to see how those transfers pan out um, because it's not like they're the highest graded guys. This isn't a Walter Rouse coming in. This isn't, um, you know, uh, some of the guys that you've been able to get in, through the doors in the past. It's it's going to take a lot more work, I think, this offseason. For me, everything comes down to those three road games I mentioned, Auburn, Ole Miss, and Missouri. Uh, those loom extremely large. If you can navigate those three, I think you open the door for nine wins, maybe. And then if things go right against Texas, who knows? Again, coin toss, uh, you might get to 10. You might get to 10 in the bowl game. I think that's a very, very successful season in 2024. Um, but you can't muck around like you did in Lawrence last year in Stillwater and lose games like that, that you should win against inferior teams. You just can't. Um, we'll see. We'll see how that uh, – we'll see how that – pans out obviously let's switch gears randall i want to ask you about the new signing period the new early signing period they moved it up to what was it december 3rd before championship weekend this year 
considering doing it up. Okay, they're going to consider it, but I think everybody's on board with doing right. that because yes. the coaches are all like, this is the worst week of my life. We can't continue to do this the first two weeks of December. Um, it alleviates potentially just an impossible time crunch, um, unless, of course, you're in one of those championship games and then it adds to the time crunch. But the fact of the matter is there's so little drama with signing day anymore, Randall. Yeah. Shouldn't be a problem if your ducks are in a row, if you've got everybody lined up, if you've got everybody on board culture wise, but that moving it up to championship weekend before the weekend, Wednesday before, and then after Sunday, after the championship weekend comes the opening of the transfer portal. Uh, they're, they're, they're cramming everything into the first week of December and it's going to be, it's going to be busy. It's going to be a heck of a week. I, I think that it was kind of designed to, make sure that uh, signing period wasn't overlapping with the transfer portal because that's how it's been, um, you know, yeah. since this early signing period really became grew in popularity. Um, I remember as, uh, you know, an elementary school, early middle school kids uh, being excited for the February signing day because that's when all the big news, big decisions came. Now it feels like nobody signs in February anymore because they've already done it in, in December. Um, at this point, most of the uh, the big time recruits that you're getting anyway are going to be January enrollees. And so they'll already be planning to get to Norman um, and will already have been signed on campus by February. Um, I, I think that, like you mentioned, for a team like Oklahoma, I, a coach like Brent Venables, who really likes to have his ducks in a row to really like that, really likes to have all the um, all these things lined up and organized ahead of time. Uh, we saw that this year. Uh, he said it at the uh, the signing day press conference What they had 20 of 27 guys sign at the early signing period in December. All of those guys were already committed. I think the only one who wasn't um, committed before this, you know, first weekend of December date was Eddie Pierre Louis, who ended up committing on December fifteenth, so a, around a week before uh, the the early signing period. And so, for a team like Oklahoma, if they're able to continue recruiting like they have been, I think that this um, shouldn't really change anything negatively. Maybe it makes things easier on Brent Venables and his staff um, because now you're not overlapping with the transfer portal window, um, but. Uh, I think that, again, uh, Oklahoma, they like to have these guys already on board and already kind of know where they stand before signing day. So I don't think that this will change much for Oklahoma. Uh, I, I do think it's interesting um, that, they, that also in this that there might be a third signing period added, um, which would be in the sometime in the summer, June, July, August. Uh, and that's that's really interesting. Um, Parker pointed out on Parker Thune pointed out on Twitter today. What's the point of a recruit signing in June? I don't really know, understand why. But again, college football is constantly changing. College sports in general are constantly changing. And so uh, if that signing period is added, I'm sure we'd see some kids uh, sign then. And, and it would be really interesting to kind of see how um, coaches, recruiting staffs kind of maneuver that because the summer has typically been a huge time for recruiting, right? That's when you get kids on visits. That's when you get kids in for camps. I mean, that's when everyone is obviously free. They're not worried about school or their actual football season um, kind of getting in the way. So you're able to get kids on campus and do things like that. Uh, and so it feels like that could be a real hot spot for recruiting in general, because if you're able to get a kid on campus a week before the summer signing period, that might be, um, you know, a way to land these kids uh, even earlier. Um, and so, so for a program like Oklahoma, who hosts their elite prospect camps and who has these big recruiting events in the summer, uh, a summer signing period would be really interesting to see kind of how that fits. And um, I think the last thing I'll say on this for Oklahoma, on the Oklahoma side, I think is that uh, it's really good timing that Oklahoma is bringing in a bunch of new recruiting staffers so they can all kind of delineate and decide how to handle this now. I mean, we, we mentioned um, Joe Liale coming in, obviously with J.R. Sandlin leaving, uh, Oklahoma is going to have to make a replacement there. We, we hear maybe Curtis Lofton, some other names. Uh, and so to have those new guys in the building, it'll be really good for them to start the same year that these potential changes might go down. And that way, Oklahoma kind of has a, um, a uniform plan in place of how to handle this. Ryan, any thoughts on uh, the first week of December and how busy we're going to be? I, I mean, yeah, we have a signing day in summer and December and February. That's just more content for us, man. I I, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, doing the that signing day thing three times a year now instead of just the one. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> well, to, to anyone that asks why a kid wouldn't sign in June, why do we study history kids to learn? Um, at, when the new signing day came in, the early signing day, there was a lot of like, is anyone going to use this, whatever? February signing day isn't even signing day anymore. It's early signing day. Now, I don't see a world in which every kid signing in June 
But I, I think that you just are not a student of history if you don't look and see that every time it's been moved up, kids are like, yeah, I'd like to get this thing done. And it's long been an idea of like, okay, if you sign in June or July or the first week of August and you, you say some system like, okay, you can write down two coaches, whether that be your head coach and for like Jack Snarl, it might've been Brett Vittables and Jeff Levy. And then if either one of those guys are no longer on staff, no questions asked. You can be released from your letter of intent. Your recruitment opens back up. But if I'm Jack Snowden, I know I want to play under Jeff Levy. I want to play under Brent Venables. He might have been a guy that very easily, and I, I don't know this, but he might have been a guy that's like, yeah, as long as those two guys are there, I'm rock with Oklahoma sick. If there's no staff changes, he doesn't have to worry about being blown up during the season calls, all this. If he knows, he knows, and he can roll with it. And I think that uh, I – I think that you're just not a student of history if you don't think that that's not something people are going to utilize. Because how often do we hear a ton of these kids, why do they want their stuff done in June and July? So they can just focus on their senior season. They know what's happening, all that stuff. For as much as we focus on decommitments, how many of those summer commitments, like it's a high percentage of those guys for Oklahoma the last couple of years that have signed. So as long as there's not big, big changes and stuff like that, it, it, I think there would be – It's. I don't think it will be like the early signing period is today, which is that is signing day. I I think that there would be a good number of kids still that would be like, yeah, if I know it and if I've got this little backup that's like, yeah, there's a coaching change, I'm not still locked in, then why wouldn't I just say, I, I know this, I know Brent Venables, I know Todd Bates, I'm good, I'm just going to do it now. And the kids that want to commit in December, they can still commit in December. It's the same right. thing. I'm glad you. I'm glad you touched on that. I, sorry, I just wanted to say the the thing. You're absolutely right. I talk to recruits every day, and almost all of these kids that are juniors in high school. When I ask, "Do you have a commitment date planned?" They say, "I want to get this done before my senior year of high school." And so, to your point, that's exactly right. And that's especially the kids who like their offers already. The kids who aren't waiting to get better or more offers. Those kids, the the bigger recruits, the kids who have have accumulated a lot of offers especially from schools like Oklahoma and other programs, those kids are the ones who are ready to get things done in the summer who are, like you said, Ryan, just want to focus on playing football and finishing out their last semester of high school. You know, college sports is changing. You guys mentioned it earlier. It's evolving. It changes all the time. I just thank God that we got the criminal element of cookies and cakes cleaned out of the recruit hotel rooms Uh uh, if you're going to go over the top on something, it's damn cookies and cakes, is it not? I mean, the N NCAA can't win a court hearing, but they're attacking the things that really matter. Well, Coach that's it. That's that's right. my point. Is there's so much going on in the NCAA says no more cookies and cakes for you. <laughs> Three days. <laughs> what? Yeah. What are you doing? I hope that that policy is not changing at all sooner because the, the f fastest way to get me out the door, Hoove, is to cut our cookie cake budget because I, I do be loving some cookie cake. We will be having cookies and cakes and little chocolates and little smiley face. Oh, my gosh. So they can still this decorate the, the hotel rooms for us, just not recruits. Yeah, and that, and this is the thing. They, they here's, <laughs> here's the deal. You can, you can bring them to the hotel in a bag and meet the – the prospect in the lobby on their visit, right? It's about, it's about the, pl the prospect comes in on their visit, goes to the hotel, opens the hotel door and it's all decorated up. And it's like, wow. And they shoot their little videos and it's like, look at all they did for me. It's amazing. Can't do that anymore because it's against the rules. So you got to meet them in the lobby and hand them a bag of cookies and cakes. Jeez. So what, what are we doing? Um, the NCAA is getting its teeth kicked in and NIL nationwide uh laborers la labor relations board um you name it you name it the ncaa is getting dominated in the courts uh in the uh, state legislatures and what was the latest help me remember what was the latest you can't the ncaa can't prosecute any nil violations like there can be nil violations the ncaa just can't enforce the rules around them what so NCA comes back and says, watch this. Oh, no cookies and cakes for you in your room. <laughs> I, I, I thought, uh, you know, you mentioned the NCAA just keeps getting destroyed. Gabe Eichard brought up a really good point on Twitter saying, if a kid fails, can the NCAA even prevent him from playing for failing a class? I mean, because then can't you, couldn't he argue that uh, you're preventing him from wages? And what's the NCAA, NCAA going to do? Take it to court where they keep losing these court battles? 
Uh, I know that's a very extreme example, but it's just it's just really interesting to see um, kind of them have no um, no law, no governance over their their sports. And um, it, it's it's very, very interesting The this seems like the least important thing on the agenda that they could have tackled. Uh, but of course, they had to just check check it off the list. Say they were getting something done, I guess, uh, because they can't do anything else right now. <laughs> so weak, it's so weak. Well, um, we, uh, I asked this to you guys behind the scenes. Like this was this is not like a joke at the expense of the NCA. Serious question. Going back to the big Penn State ruling, where Penn State beat the NCAA up and down the floor, basically in the courtroom. Like, what's the last court case that the NCAA has won? And and we talk about this a lot. I think that's why they went with a politician as opposed to someone from the NCAA power structure as the new president. Because the only like in the NCAA for it feels like as long as I've been doing this has just been like Congress, help us, please, please fix this thing that we we are supposed to be the oversight and we can't have any oversight. I I just don't know like. And in the Supreme Court, which can't agree on anything, the last time anything in the Supreme Court, that, that was one of their last 9-0 rulings. And, and they're like, bring us any and all NCAA cases. We're ready to crush this. And like, the NCAA is up a creek. Here's how fast these things have changed, you guys. Just a little perspective for you. My daughter's first year to play college soccer was the first year they introduced legislation for cost of attendance. So you got a percentage of if you're on a, a scholarship like a like a equivalency sport like soccer, you're on, say, 75 percent or 50 percent um, academic or uh, athletic scholarship. That's your percentage of cost of attendance that you got. You got every school had their own little cost of attendance figure. And this is so kids can pay their cell phone bill and their car insurance and, and go out for coffee and whatnot. It's a great rule. That was 2015. And there, this came with great controversy at the time. I don't know if you guys remember that, but there was just like, well, what are we paying these kids $2,000 a semester for? <laughs> $2,000 a semester? What? That's how much this thing has changed. And if, of course, if you were on full scholarship, you got the full cost of attendance, which was always interesting to me because Manhattan, Kansas, cost of attendance was higher than Palo Alto cost of attendance. Come again? What? How does that work? I didn't ever figure that out. So, endowments, boss. It's the endowment. Hey, those kids. If they it, it, go out for coffee in Palo Alto, it's like nine bucks. Go out for coffee in Manhattan, Kansas, in 2015, it's like two dollars. <laughs> Yet the kid, the K State kids were getting more than the Stanford kids. Uh, anyway, the NCAA has been broken for a long time. Crazy. I mean- Zach Sanchez all the time on Twitter talks about how, you know, whenever he was in college, he could barely afford to pay his apartment bills with the stipends that they were getting. And now the kids are signing deals with, you know, private jets and all sorts of things. It's just <laughs> how different things are now. And hey, you know, Ryan, you mentioned the NCAA, they wanted to hire a politician instead of someone from within the internal power structure. Why not just, you know, uh, knock both out of the way? Just bring on Tommy Tuberville, politician, former head coach. You got both knocked out of the way right there. Two birds with one stone. Wow. For- he- He's not very good with processes and getting things through and done. Maybe uh, Nick Saban needs to run for senator. Wouldn't that be incredible? A Saban Tuberville primary? Can you? Sorry. <laughs> well, Saban just as the czar of college football. D- in. I'm in also definitely. That would be kind of cool. Yeah, at least like Stoops. <laughs> How about yeah? That'd be good. Him and him and Stoops. Uh, Jackson Dart gets to fly anywhere he wants because he has an NIL deal with a private jet company. That's easily the coolest NIL deal. Although the the, the quarterback at Georgia got a, a Ferrari, was it? Uh, I think an Ole Miss D lineman, uh, a JUCO signee Ole Miss D lineman got a Lamborghini too. And and I know um, I know when <laughs> I know when Bijan was in college, I think he signed with one of the Lamborghini dealerships in Austin as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, so Reggie Bush, of course, had his Heisman taken away, but these kids now have private jets and Lamborghinis. No big deal. Cost of hey, it's too much. I still <laughs> haven't seen a Taco Bell NIL deal, and that one will take the cake when it comes. Shout out to our friends. Think outside the bell. Box, bun, whatever. We I like it. it. Yep. Um, all right. So guys who are professional athletes, right? Wait. What did I just say? Guys who are no longer college athletes, they're actually professionals, actually making money at their craft. 
Andrew Rame, Walter Rouse, and McCade Matoyer all at the combine. Uh, that's three offensive linemen. Offensive linemen aren't going to move the needle a lot. So I think a lot of people around here are going to want to watch Caleb Williams. Only problem is he's not throwing at the combine. You guys going to watch the combine for any reason this week? Probably uh, maybe to see some testing numbers, but probably uh, it doesn't seem like this year is too heavy in uh, our our focus as OU beat writers. Um, like you said, the the offensive line, um, it'll be big, big days for those guys, especially, you know, someone like Rame who, um, I mean, obviously, Walter Rouse, we kind of know that his athleticism is more limiting. It's his size, his IQ that that really um, sticks out to NFL teams. But with Raym, it's, it's interesting because I think there's a lot more questions about the athleticism from NFL teams. Again, I, I've talked to NFL scouts uh, personally who, who really like Raym and have for a few years. Um, so I think that it'll be really interesting to see uh, not only when he gets out there on the testing, but what those teams think of him in the meeting rooms. Because I think that what I've heard from people around OU's program and what I've heard from scouts uh, that are not around OU's program about Andrew Rame are very, very different. And so I think it'll be interesting to see um, what teams think of him when he goes through that interview process. And then, of course, what he looks like athletically out there, you know, on the field, how he tests, things like that, his, his strength, things like that. Yeah. I, I don't think uh, – I just have a suspicion that Rame is not going to test. He's not going to put up huge numbers. Um, they're going to get him in the the – interview rooms and they're going to ask him all kinds of football questions. I think he's got a high, high football IQ. I think they'll be impressed. But how often does a college center get drafted? Three-year starter, he knows what he's doing. How often does a college center get, get drafted in the first two days, right? So he's probably a day three guy. Rouse might be a day two guy just because he's got offensive tackle skills and a, and a really good college resume. Uh, Matoyer, probably a free agent guy would be my, my, my guess. Is Guyton not at the combine? Uh, Tyler Guyton is at the I combine. Thought, I thought it was Guyton and not Matoyer. Oh, Matoyer! What am I thinking? You're 100 percent right. Thank you for clearing that up for me. I was, I wrote down Matoyer earlier in the week and thought, huh, that's interesting because he's probably not going to get drafted. It is Guyton. Thank and, you. And Guyton, of course, that's going to be, I think, what he's going to be the guy that not only us as OU beat writers, but NFL teams are going to be lining up to see him. Yeah, I mean. They love him. You, you know, we all know that he's obviously huge, 6'7", 330, an a, amazing athlete for a guy who is that big. I mean, he played tight end, played defensive line, played defensive line in high school, tight end at TCU before moving to offensive tackle. Um, and that, that again, we've seen that, um, that kind of transition um, work well for offensive line, especially tackles, because it helps with the footwork, the athleticism, things mm-hmm. like that. Um, He's been projected by a lot of people as a first rounder. I need to see him play into being a first rounder because I don't think he did it last year at Oklahoma. He uh, he could have played zero snaps of football at Oklahoma last year. He could have rolled up to the combine and what he's going to test. He'll be a first round pick, which is why I don't watch the combine. Orlando Brown is twice the tackle that Tyler Guyton was at Oklahoma yeah. and because he can't doesn't want to do the bench. Uh, he dropped, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I cover the combine when all you guys are there, but for me, the combine is the way that the NFL has like made it a massive thing. I understand it's a traits league and that's like really, really important. I couldn't care less about the combine. I, I get it, but I'm just like, cool, sick. Uh, run your 40, run your 40 at pro day. I, I don't care. And I, I don't care to watch dudes in underwear run 40 yard dashes. Not, not my cup of tea. Well, and you know, you mentioned Guyton at Oklahoma. I mean, he didn't even start the last three games of the year because the Sooners wanted to start Jacob Sex. I mean, we talked to to Brent Venables, and he said Tyler Guyton's available, and they chose to start Jacob Sexton. Now, yeah. that doesn't necessarily mean that Jacob Sexton is a better player, more talented than Tyler Guyton. But uh, like you said, it's not it with Guyton. It's more of an upside projection based on that athleticism, um, with additionally some of the flashes that he showed at Oklahoma. But it's not he was definitely not a perfect prospect. Uh, it, it is interesting, though, that a guy like that uh, could be Bill Biedenboe's second first round pick ever. Uh, you know, after all the guys he's put into the league, that Anton Harrison and Tyler Guyton is two first round picks. And, and he didn't even finish the year in the starting lineup. That was such a weird deal um, that you've got a projected first rounder and he's over there on the bench. Yep. And he's healthy. Yep. And he's able to play. There must have been something about, Coach, uh, I'm going to join the draft this year. Okay, cool. Uh, when you get healthy, you're going to be second team. And, and even even on senior day, he went through senior day festivities 
and yeah. didn't start in the game. He played yeah. in the game. He got into the game against TCU, but did not start. And actually, after he got put into the game, he got pulled back out and replaced for Sexton again in that game. And again, I'm not saying that Sexton outplayed him in that game or at all this season. But yeah, it, it is very weird. And it's interesting. And, and I'm sure NFL teams will ask him about that because, I mean, they're not idiots. They know these things. Um, and they'll, they'll do their homework and they'll talk to Brent Venables and Bill Beatonbow and these guys. But I think that, like, I mean, we've been saying with with the athleticism and just the size that he's got, those two things combined, no team is not no team, but he's not going to get out of the first round unless he just bombs the interview process. Wow. I can't believe I wrote down Matoyer and went and went <laughs> ahead with that. I'm glad I got you guys here to reel me in <laughs> on, on stupid stuff that I say. Anyway, uh, Matoyer's got a shot. I'm not saying he doesn't. He's yeah. he's a uh, He's a very experienced uh, and extremely smart um, offensive guard. I, I think, think he'll be. I think he's I got think, a future in the NFL. I think teams will like the the character uh, and how he is in the locker room too. We know that he's a guy who stuck up for his teammates and things like that. NFL yeah. teams like that. Great in interviews, um, which brings us to the beginning of the show when we said, "Oh, OU's offensive line is totally rebuilt." Here's why: There's four guys going and going for jobs in the NFL. Hey, if you're on Twitter, give us a follow at all underscore Sooners. I'm at John E Hoover. Ryan's at underscore Ryan Chapman. Randall is at Randall Sweet 5. You can find Ross at Ross Lovelace. And the new guy, Bryce McKinnis, is at McKinnis Bryce. Website is allsooners.com. We are a fan nation affiliate, part of the Sports Illustrated Network. All Sooners is free. No signups, no emails, no passwords, no credit cards. If you want to advertise with All Sooners, just drop me an email at allsoonersSI at gmail.com or just DM me on Twitter at John E. Hoover. All right, Randall. Recruiting. If you got time, we got a little bit of time here. Um, you sent me a list of guys that OU is big on. I see three linebackers and a tight end that they've been after for about a year now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of are, are we going in the 2025 direction? We can talk about uh, yeah. so these guys that are that are upcoming uh, planning visits to Oklahoma now. Luke Metz is a linebacker from uh, Georgia Mill Creek. Uh, actually recently picked up an offer from OU, even though he's been to Norman uh, before. Uh, and, and the same day that he he actually um, picked up the offer from OU, he released his top six. Oklahoma made the cut there. Uh, he, he has confirmed that he's um, you know planning on taking a visit to Norman now. And again, this is a guy that, you know, you look at that the Brent Venable style of linebacker, um, you know, kind of a, a Danny Stutzman coming out of high school where flies around the field, you know, sideline to sideline, runs downhill, drills running backs through the gaps. Just a really fast player that kind of plays with his hair on fire, really physical. Uh, again, not not saying that he is, he plays exactly like Danny Stutzman. He will end up being Danny Stutzman. But those 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 traits where he has the speed and the size, uh, likes to you know run and hit people. That that kind of thing. Again, typical Brent Venables middle linebacker mold. Uh, you know, you mentioned the tight end Chase Lofton, another guy who's planning on visiting Oklahoma. I was there when Chase Lofton got his first offer. It was to Oklahoma. It was actually at the Brent Venables elite camp that I mentioned earlier in the show. Um, and this is a guy, 6'5", over 200 pounds, uh, moves really, really well uh, for that size. I mean, it, his movement is smooth when he's running his, his uh, routes. You can see in and out of his breaks, he drops his hips and uh, gets back into the route really quickly, which you don't see very often for six foot five, two hundred ten pound sophomores, juniors at the tight end position. Um, he's obviously blown up since Oklahoma offered him, as you know many of these kids do. Uh, he's now actually a four star prospect. He was unranked when Oklahoma first offered him. His dad was a football player at Iowa uh, under Kirk Ferentz. His brother plays tight end at Kansas State. So really like the the bloodline there. If you're Oklahoma, is a guy that is a great, great receiving tight end. Um, it, he would, he would probably need, um, you know, to take some coaching on, on the blocking aspect, not that he's not a good blocker, but just being a lighter guy right now, he would need to, to bulk up, get some, some of the blocking chops, but as a receiving tight end, he he's really skilled there. That would be a, a huge pickup for OU who is battling for multiple tight ends in that 2025 class. We've talked about Nate Roberts. There's obviously Lincoln cure from Goodland, Kansas as well. Uh, Desan Brame from Derby, Kansas. Now Chase Lofton. So that's that's four um, high highly recruited tight ends that Oklahoma is after. Um, you know, and, and then just to keep going down that um, 2025 class. Uh, you know, Max Granville. He's an edge rusher. Uh, we've talked about him multiple times on the podcast before. He's uh, from the Houston area, Fort Bend. Uh, elite, elite recruit, top 80, top 100 player, depending on where you look. Alabama, all the a lot of the big time programs, Alabama, Georgia, all the big time programs are after this guy. He's 
visited Oklahoma before, seems to have a really good relationship. I know that he's one of OU's top priorities in that 2025 class. Uh, he would be a huge addition. That defensive line already has two pretty good prospects, and Kamori Moore on the interior, Alexander Shield Knight on the edge. Uh, Max Granville would add a, a nice uh, edge option on the other side of Shield Knight in that class, kind of a different skill set. Uh, and I think that um, that OU is in a good spot with him. Granville is planning on visiting Norman as well coming up. Uh, and so if the Sooners can land a commitment from him, I think he would be the uh, highest rated commit on the defensive side of the ball in that 2025 class. Again, uh, we've seen what Oklahoma was, was able to do in the trenches in 2024. If you can build on that in 2025, add another guy like Max Granville, who kind of fits the R. Mason Thomas role where he's, uh, you know, not the not P.J. out of Wari, where he's super tall, super long, but he's he's a, he's a really fast, really quick, twitchy, good bend off the edge. Uh, that, that's kind of more of the Max Granville style. And, and then, you know, just to kind of r wrap up that group, uh, Dawson Merritt, who, you know, you mentioned a, a linebacker out of uh, Blue Valley or Stillwell, Kansas, Blue Valley High School, elite, elite prospect, top 40, 50 player in the country, depending on where you look. One of the top linebackers in the country, again, offers from all over. I know that he's visiting Oklahoma as well. He's planning on releasing a top schools list pretty soon. Uh, and so I would look for Oklahoma to be included in that. And I think that um, you know, Brent Venables and the Sooners, they're going to keep pushing hard. He's definitely going to be back in Norman for a game day visit if he doesn't commit before then, just be because of how close Stillwell is. Oklahoma really wants to take control of Kansas and, and things like that in the recruiting grounds. Have you heard anything today about Peacock? Uh, I know that uh, he was planning on announcing his commitment on a YouTube live stream of Dave Campbell's Texas football at 12.05. Yeah. I've got it right here, but I can't tell uh and it's 1209 currently so we, we, it would be uh happening live yeah it's live, live. He's got a hat on, but i just can't see whose it is they've got the camera like way far back i can't see who the uh, hat is let's, so you, let's guys, you guys talk amongst yourselves i will uh i've got the stream up um but uh, oklahoma that 2025 class continues to um to push for for guys i think that it's really interesting um the regionality that the sooners have tried to to kind of dominate again you, you who've mentioned earlier in the podcast OU and Missouri being a real battle that game is probably going to decide a lot of recruitments uh Oklahoma and Missouri have both been recruiting the state of Kansas heavily there's been uh recently the past this year the past few years there's been a ton of high level prospects out of the state the sunshine state uh sun, sunflower state sorry not sunshine state uh Oklahoma being just south of Kansas really really wants to um you know take a hold of those recruiting grounds and I think that um if they can get a guy like a Dawson Merritt, uh, that, that would be huge. Uh, Andrew Babalola, uh, Lincoln Cure, some other guys that they're after in that 2025 class from Kansas. I think that those three guys are very highly coveted prospects. If OU can land any of those three, that would be a huge boost to the 25 class. Uh, and <laughs> I, I mean, you know, to, to, to keep going, I know that, um, you know, despite having three receivers already committed in 2025, Oklahoma's pushing really, really hard for Cooper Perry. Um, now, Cooper Perry right now is crystal balled or recruiting machine, whatever service you use. It's projected to end up at Oregon right now, but uh, Oklahoma will get an official visit and Oklahoma will actually get the last of his official visits. I think he's planning on visiting Oregon June 7th. I think Oklahoma is getting that visit June 21st. Um, if it, Obviously, if, if he doesn't commit uh, while he's at Oregon or another school. But I think that OU getting that final visit is going to be huge for the Sooners because we know Brent Venables likes to have that last visit to kind of make that final push, see yeah. if he can really get in in uh, in a recruit's head before he makes that decision. Uh, Cooper Perry and Oklahoma have been able to build a really good relationship so far. And if they are able to get him on campus on June 21st, I think that they would have a real shot at adding a highly, a highly touted four-star wide receiver to a group that already has three four-star wide receivers and one of the top 10, 15 quarterbacks in the country. Good job stretching that out. You've got a career in radio if you want it, right, Ryan? Um, so got to stretch, baby. Got to stretch. Little, I'm a little colorblind, so when you start saying, is that hat red or is that hat green, I I have trouble telling it apart. So I have to, I had to do a screenshot, and then I had to blow it up. It's a Baylor hat. He co just committed to Baylor. Because, what, what, what did we say before the podcast? Seems like SMU or Baylor. Yeah, interesting. It, very interesting. All right. It, just Peacock, a guy who who had some injury issues this year. Um, not saying OU backed off, but maybe there was some hesitation just, uh, you know, with the injuries, uh, kind of what he would look like coming back from. Good player, good get for Baylor.
Yeah, good for them. Uh, Ryan, let's talk some basketball. Sooners are at uh, number eight, Iowa State. We'll try to hustle today's podcast out, get it up so you guys can be surprised, right? I guess, I don't know. You can watch it tonight, watch it tomorrow, listen whenever you want uh, here on the All Sooners podcast. The Bedlam game was incredible, unbelievable. And frankly, it'd be a shame. It'd be a damn shame if they don't renew this rivalry out of conference play. Okay. Put your pride aside and play the games. But uh, man, JV and McCollum's game winner. <laughs> it was maybe, it was one of those, like the worst best shot I've seen in a long time. Like you, I'll give you, um, you just got to stop, right? You just got a defensive stop rebound. You come up the floor, you call timeout. And then you spend the next 11.9 seconds dribbling, dribbling, <laughs> dribbling. And I'm like, that's the play you called? That's the play you called on offense? Uh, is it, oh, my God, he's put – that's a terrible shot. Wow, he made it. That's a, Oh, and that's a buzzer beater. That was my reaction during that whole 12 seconds after the timeout. Um, unbelievable. Yeah, somewhere Paul George is pointing and yelling about that being an awful shot. Like, he's yeah. pissed about it. I just – Can I slide this in real quick? And I know I'm not the audience for this. Every other game between Porter Moser and Mike Boynton has been an assault on basketball. Let's not like, let's not forget that one prisoner of the moment, like apparently buzzer beaters are only allowed to happen in Bedlam games. I cried because the game in Norman was one of the worst played basketball games of the entire big 12 season. So let's not let it was a great Bedlam moment, and this in itself was a great game. But putting these two teams on the same floor does not guarantee good basketball games. Not All three of the games not. last year were awful. Both games in, in uh, the year before were awful basketball games. Like, they just got lucky that Otega Owe refused to cover a backdoor cut and that suddenly uh, Oklahoma could get to the rim. So, I, of all the, like, belly aching and all that crap, th- these have been awful basketball games between – Porter Moser and Mike Boynton's teams. They got one. That doesn't mean that this has to be a must have home and home every single year. This series should continue. It's a layup, put at the Paycom center, go back and forth, whatever they've got to do. Mike Boynton and Porter Moser both talked about it a ton that like next year, probably unlikely just because of how quickly the schedule, like I don't think OU has an SEC scheduling model yet, frankly, based off the way that Porter Moser is kind of talking about putting together that non-conference, but I would expect, what would that be? The twenty. 526 season would that be the the next year that once they know they get that thing in it was an awesome game but let, let's not like paint this this bedlam game with the brush of the last like six before it that were all like just gross I'll just give not you, even fundamentals i'll give you that it's it's not easy on the eyes to watch bedlam on in basketball but one of my favorite all-time bedlam games was eddie sutton versus kelvin Boom. That instantly cuts 20 points off the total right there. 40 to 38. Is that the final? I think it was 48, 46. <laughs> I don't have the records in front of me, but my mind, my old damaged brain says, I think it's 48, 46, something like that. Um, and it was a buzzer beater. It was, uh, I think what was Victor Williams, I think made, made a layup at the buzzer or something like that. It was incredible. Just an inc- guys were fighting and pushing each other and spitting. And it was just amazing. And I was sitting courtside for that one. Back in, I think, 2002, 2003, maybe 2002, I believe. But, yeah, it was fantastic. It was 48-46. It was an ugly it – a, it was a rock fight, and uh, it was beautiful. We should add Bedlam Rugby then because, uh, like, I'm – I, I as someone that covers basketball, I couldn't be more excited to move to the SEC. I hate Big 12 basketball. It's like a – it's a physical – just fist fight every night. And thank thank God for Jamie Dixon's TCU teams who have brought some pace into the league. Thank God that uh, Scott drew and his Baylor teams have like, Hey, you can play offense. Kansas only plays offense at home this year. Like Houston basketball, they're probably going to win a national championship. And it's like, I want to throw up every time the Houston plays and you're going to throw up twice this week, watching Oklahoma play. They've got number eight, Iowa state on the road. That's just going to be an absolute grinder because it's it's the same matchup. Iowa State hasn't had this big adjustment that they're playing different from that first game of the Big 12 slate. But I think that there's a lot more confidence. It's in Hilton. Iowa State's unbeaten in Hilton this year. Plus, no John Hughley for Oklahoma. Really tall task, obviously. And then Saturday night, it'll be fun to have Kelvin Sampson back, I guess, for the memories, I guess, of winning ugly basketball games. 
you're going to get an ugly basketball game, regardless if it's a blowout or not on Saturday night. But you had to win that Bedlam game, whether it was the the grossest thing ever or whether it was the the uh, last second buzzer beater. Because a, a lot of people, twenty wins is kind of the the you get to twenty and you feel good. They're sitting at nineteen right now. Cincinnati, that midweek game at home next week is the other must win. So this pulls the pressure off Oklahoma a little bit as far as you don't have to go out there and go into Hilton and do something that no one else in the country has been able to do this year. And you don't have to up in Houston to feel like you're still going to be okay for the tournament. Obviously, if you nab either one of these games, like Porter Moser can sleep easy and you're set like the games this week could take you up a whole line in bracketology because of the competition that you've got at, at Iowa state and hosting the top ranked team in the country on Saturday night. Yeah. Here's how big Oklahoma state was beating Oklahoma state. They stink, right? They're bad. And you have to win that game because the alternative is you lose it, right? You lose to a team with a record like that. That's a, that's a bad one. And then you've got the rest of uh, your big 12 schedule coming up. Um, How about BYU in their first ever conference trip to Kansas winning at the fog, something Oklahoma hasn't been able to do in 30 some years now. Unbelievable. And, and one of BYU's top scorers, Ada alumni, Jackson Robinson. Wow. I didn't know that. Yep, you and him. <laughs> We're basically the same. Yeah. <laughs> same thing. Uh, the fun basketball being played is going to be a Norman Wednesday night. It, it's yeah. not going to be a Let's, uh Randall's going to cover that game. It's OU uh, number 20 in the country versus Texas number three in the country. OU's number one in the standings. Texas is number two. They're a game behind. Uh, Sooners are 20 and seven and 14 and two. Texas is 13 and three in conference play. I think they got 26 wins. Uh, yeah, 6 p.m. tonight, Randall. That's uh, I'm Jenny Baranchik's got this thing figured out. She really has got uh, the, in terms of the culture and her, her her comments yesterday at the press conference. She didn't want to see the horns down. She didn't want to see people talking trash. She didn't want to see people walking in just to say, "Well, I hope we beat Tech." This is the Texas game. We got to be here for Texas. She doesn't want to see that. She wants to see a packed house because it's OU women's basketball. Yeah, and, and that that was really cool uh, of her to hear. You know, she said that on on Saturday. I, I can't remember who asked, but someone someone asked. You know, what, what would it mean to have this house packed out against Texas? And she said, "I hope people come, but I hope they don't come because it's Texas. I hope they come because it's us. They want to see us play." Yeah. Uh, and and like Ryan said, they're the fun. They're the more fun basketball team of the two to watch. They yeah. play really fast. They score a ton of points. I think they've scored ninety plus in two of their last three games at least, which is really impressive. They've got multiple girls who are versatile scorers. They can really fill up the stat sheet. They they run up and down the court. They have a lot of energy and effort on offense and on defense too. And I mean if if you know you haven't been paying attention, they just waxed Oklahoma State on Saturday. Again, scoring 91 points. I think they shot like 49% from the field and like 39% from 3. Uh, Sahara Williams, who I think we've touched on before, at true freshman, she's she looked great against Oklahoma State. She's really been coming along in this impressive two-month stretch that the Sooners have had. Obviously, Skylar Van and Peyton Verholst are the two uh, leaders on that team, but they've got a lot of really good options, even down to the bench. Uh, and I think they've won 14 of their last 16 games. A win against Texas tonight would uh, guarantee them a share of the Big 12 title for the second straight year, which would be huge for Jenny Bronchak. Uh and, and it seems like, you know, like you mentioned, she's got this thing rolling. Uh, 14 of the last 16 wins is just it, crazy impressive, especially because both of those two losses came on the road to ranked teams, one at West Virginia and one at Kansas State. Um, again, two conference titles in two consecutive years for Jenny Baranchek. Again, another pro- likely another top four seed in the tournament this year for Oklahoma, especially if they can you know get a, get a win um, against Texas or against Kansas uh, on uh, Saturday. Um, and so. I, just like you mentioned, what she's done with the team, the culture, it's, it's really impressive. They're a fun, fun team to watch. Uh, if you can't get down to the Lloyd Noble Center to watch that game tonight, I definitely recommend watching it on TV. It's going to be a good game. Oklahoma beat Texas the last time these two teams faced. That was kind of uh, really the eye-opener in the middle of this big win streak that this Oklahoma team was more than just on a hot streak, that they were actually a really good team. Uh, it seems like they're really starting to put it all together at the right time, too, you know, just before the tournament. Fun team to watch. What was a cool moment for me was uh... – Lexi Keys, former Oklahoma State player, scores her 1,000th career point, and Baranchik has a ball there courtside for her to present to her immediately after the game. Here's a ball to commemorate your 1,000th point that you scored against your old team. Um, 
and that's the culture that she's talking about. That's the family, you know, business or whatever, the family kind of atmosphere that they're building that she wants to build at Oklahoma, at a Oklahoma basket, women's basketball. It's, it's really cool to watch. Um, and she said, we got a chance tonight. She said it yesterday. So she's, we got a chance tomorrow night, Wednesday to, uh, to cut down some nets. Yep. So if you're an OU basketball fan, that's, that's where you ought to be. Ryan, um, someone who doesn't cut down a lot of nets but wins a lot of championships, <laughs> or Patty Gasso talking about it last night, is that softball team. They're 14-0. and 0, They've got nine shutouts. They've got eight run rules. And all anyone wants to talk about is this new stadium. Yeah, just <laughs> no big deal. A, a over $40 million facility that's going to triple the square footage footprint of OU softball. Yeah, I mean, it, it was the weekend you wanted, the Mary Nutter, before – they open everything this week, which we'll talk about here in a second. You go back to last week, Patty Gasso wanted a more athletic, more intense, more locked in group. Got kind of halted up by nothing of their own. UCLA and, and them rolling long meant that their two games at the Murray Dutter on Friday were pushed back an hour, hour and a half, basically. Who was counting, except us losers here that had to cover that. Uh, <laughs> but it was one of those things where Mississippi State came out, pushed Oklahoma early. They immediately responded. The offense was locked in all weekend. Uh, they jumped out on Wisconsin. Wisconsin got a couple runs back, but the Sooners rolled there. And then uh, Kirsten Deal, the complete game, shut out against San Diego State. A couple good performances on Sunday against Seattle. The Ola Marymount meant that the Sooners were playing the kind of softball where I think Patty Gasso can take a step back. And, yes, they're having to prepare for Miami, Ohio, Louisiana, and Liberty this weekend. But I think that this week there, there's going to be a good deal of being able to say – enjoy this moment no no one gets to open a new stadium that's what jt gasso told us on radio yesterday like no one gets to do that and you guys get to do it four thousand plus the the new digs for loves field it's going to be an absolute scene this weekend five games to get that thing rolling and uh it, it's so weird it's going to be like a a it's a, like a soft launch almost it's going to be fully operational for the game day aspect of it but oklahoma's still gonna be like getting dressed at marita hines and patty gas is like i don't care we'll get dressed anywhere we'll walk over who gives a rip when you look at what love's field is going to be which is an absolute just diamond in in patty gasso's softball program she, she's likened it to they were living on the east side it's time to open up the mansion and move all in and so it's going to be really cool, not just for this team and what they get to do. By the end of the month, it should be by April. Certainly, they'll be fully moved in and have all of the team rooms, rest, recovery, all that will be opened up. And so uh, if anyone's going out this weekend and then they don't get to catch another OU softball game at home until like regional play come May, uh, it's going to look like a, a totally different site almost, which is not to say it won't be. Uh, humming this weekend and it's uh it's gonna set the standard for what softball facilities are in the country she it, it, said yesterday at her press conference uh we've been living on the east side we're ready to move into a mansion after which for about the next three hours i had the theme from the jeffersons in my head <laughs> moving on up to the east side yeah, yeah. Uh, seriously I, the, again i'm an old guy and i used to watch uh 70s tv shows what can i say but um, she she talked about Reeves. She was getting emotional through this twenty minute press conference. She talked about Reeves Park and how there was not enough space on the in the dugout. You know, it's a city park, right? Not enough space in the dugout for everybody. So some of the players had to sit on the bleachers back behind the the dugout. Like what? And they they would dress at home, come to the game in their uniform, go home in their uniform and uh, and dress. Or sometimes they would dress in the bathrooms. And now they're at Marita Hines, and it's like, oh, this is great. Yeah, but it's 30 years old. It's time to move on to this friggin' palace. So you got to be happy for the program and, and how she's built that thing up. That, that's exactly what I was going to say. It's really cool to see them go from where Little League Baseball is played, sharing a field with those guys, to now their own um, amazing facility. Who have you pointed out on social media? What a cool-looking scoreboard, the shape of, the shape of Oklahoma. Just ha happy for the, the program. It's, it's really cool to see um, from for them, yeah. How many zeros does the scoreboard have? And is it gonna are they gonna have to go into the panhandle <laughs> or for some of those home runs? I have it on good authority. The panhandle will get used for the line score on the scoreboard. And to which I was like, it's gonna be a total waste if the panhandle's not used for the line score. So I think that's gonna be a feature of it. I'm interested to see what said back in eighteen thirty six about the panhandle of Oklahoma, right? Uh, it'll be perfect for the line score. Place. let's cut it off and uh, give it to somebody else. T Texas didn't want it anymore. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I'm curious for the creative of like, 
So what what's the protocol for like framing shots when you know that like it's gonna not be in a rectangle? It's gonna be it, the full usage. It'll, it'll be cool. I think we'll be able to do a bunch of cool things with that. But uh, it, it'll be interesting just to see how the whole thing works as far as it, Oklahoma. They have the penchant for like showing up and rising to the occasion, and when the lights shine the brightest, they play their best. I'm curious to see if you see some nerves this weekend because it is a monumental moment and it, it is no offense, but Miami of Ohio, a, a team that Oklahoma smacked a couple of times last year. Like is Oklahoma so wrapped up in it that it's a cagey start or is it a home run parade right off the front? Cause they, they live up to the the opening. It'll be interesting to see how all that gets managed in uh Sorry if you hit the first home run ball. Patty Gasso is already determined. You don't get to keep that bad boy. It's, it's going with the trophy room. Yeah, cool, it, uh, cool weekend coming in Norman. Maybe uh, since you know they still have to dress in Marita Hines and walk over to Love's Field, maybe we'll get a walk of champion style uh, uh, path for them for them to walk along as that'd they walk. Cool. Yeah, that'd be, that's a good field. idea. That's a real great idea. Can you imagine the softball fans, four thousand softball fans lining the the path, and then all of a sudden everybody just runs to their seats? That would be crazy. They would, like they would a regular freshman run or whatever. OU fans would do it too. That's the thing. Yes, they would. Absolutely. This loves softball. We we started the uh, podcast in Vegas, so we're going to finish it in Vegas. Uh, baseball is uh, in Vegas right now. They're five and three. Here's the deal with this baseball team: they obliterated Wright State three times, and then in the finale, I mean, they beat them twenty to nothing. They had like forty five hit, fifty five hits, whatever it was, fifty one hits. I can't even remember. It's so high. Then in the finale, they got run. They got just obliterated twelve to two golly that's that's baseball you beat the crap out of a team three times you might get the crap beat out of you four times that's just the nature of baseball i think it was like casey stengel said something like you're going to win a third of your games you're going to lose a third of your games it's that other third that's in the middle the close ones that determines what kind of season you have something like that i think he said 40 and 40 but uh, who's who's counting uh, three games in vegas this week they got Pitt, cal and ohio state it's friday saturday and sunday i think those are a good test and they're going to need that because they got Wichita State coming to town next weekend. Hey, look at that. Schedule opens up. Big 12 play starts next weekend when UCF comes to Norman. Three games followed by a midweek against Oklahoma State the following week in Norman. So baseball is getting rolling. It's getting real important up in here. And, you know, it seems like it seems like the team has some promise. You know, obviously, Kendall Pettis is a, is a veteran on the team now. You've got – we talked about him last week, Reggie Willicks. Obviously, uh, Spikerman, I think, uh, had an injury last weekend, so hopefully he'll be able to uh, suit up for OU. But, you know, you, uh, the, the Witherspoon brothers have some potential. It seems like as the team grows and later in the season, they could become a really good unit with some of the individual talents they have. It just seems like, uh, you know, in some of those losses, there may be – uh, taking some time to grow as a team, see what they've got in the uh, in the pitching staff, things like that. They picked a good week to go to Las Vegas, didn't they? Yeah, they did. They did. Also, like Wright State too. They're what picked top of the Horizon League. They've been a tournament team the last couple of years. So yeah. I think the consensus was play good baseball in three of those games. If you go three or four, I know you're not. If you're a Diamond Sports fan that's been locked into softball, like yeah, they run really well. Like that's that's just college baseball for you. It is. It's it's a little different feel a little different vibe than what the softball team does quickly on gymnastics an interesting week both men and women are ranked number one they both get michigan this week uh the women are uh hosting michigan on friday number two ranked michigan in the country and uh then on saturday the men are at number four ranked michigan up in ann arbor uh we'll have coverage of all those games meets events uh lots more all week long at all sooners and don't forget ryan's softball show he does a great job with that the All Sooner Softball Show, Tuesdays and Thursdays, right here at allsooners.com. Also on my YouTube channel, John Hoover Media. Um, let's see. Tomorrow, you're going to be previewing the OU tournament and the opening of Love's Field. Do you have Starocco again tomorrow, or is she just one time this week? No, we, we just want to link up with Alex because she she's the uh, first person that's really – uh, her and, and uh, Ryan Aber were out at the uh, Mary Nutter. Otherwise, unless we could you know, land a Chris Plank appearance, no one else has got to get eyes on OU softball. So I, I was very thankful for Alex as she literally uh, was sprinting through the airport in Denver. I think she may have trucked somebody. Uh, <laughs> we send our apologies to you, I suppose. But uh, I want to get her take on what she saw at Mary Nutter because she got to see this group eyes in person something that we'll all do this weekend. 
we'll be full speed ahead. It's the it's the Love's Field All Sooner Softball Show dropping uh, tomorrow right. at uh, noon. And uh, so they play five games Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And Ryan is going to be there for all five. Um, Randall's going to be there with the video camera. He's going to have a sights and sounds kind of uh, what's going on at Love's Field. Check it out. Here's what it looks like now. All that good stuff. So keep it here at All Sooners all weekend long. Um, you guys going to be able to survive the weekend? It's going to be cold. It's going to be windy. It's going to be weird. Historic. Okay. I'm excited. It'll be it'll be a very busy weekend for OU sports, but that uh, that's good good for us. Dog, I've been out there when it's 20 degrees. <laughs> I've been out at Marita Hines when it's raining. I do the postseason stuff when it's 100 degrees. This ain't nothing. And and yeah. I think thankfully for Norman, uh, we got a couple of cold days, and it's going to be pretty nice spring weather uh, throughout the weekend. It's gonna it's gonna open back up a little bit after this little cold front blows through. Good. As long as, long as the weather is not like it was in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, I'll be good. Yeah. No. Or Brigham Young, uh, Provo, or, or BYU. Yeah. Not, not BYU there. Hey, you guys. Thanks for listening. Appreciate you all. Uh, always being with the All Sooners podcast. You can find all of our shows anywhere you listen to your podcast, any platform. We're there. Just have, and if you have an Amazon enabled device, just say, Alexa, play the All Sooners podcast. It's also posted on our website, allsooners.com. Just click on the player and listen on your phone, your tablet, or your computer. And of course, all the shows are posted on my YouTube channel, John Hoover Media. Thanks to Ryan for the slick new packaging there. I hope you guys see that. I hope you guys saw that because it looks really good. Great job, Ryan. Looks amazing. Thank you. Uh, shout out to uh, basically I need uh, this is all again. Thanks to Alex Draco. I needed something for Alex and I to like be on the same screen for the softball show. And I was like, yeah. I think who likes this. Let's do another one. Yeah, you, you got to dress it up when you're on screen with Draco for sure. For Ryan, for Randall, I'm John Hoover. See you guys.